Let's pray. God, thank you. We were supposed to die and go to hell. We were miserable. But God, by the blood you shed on the cross, you saved us. Thank you. You saved us and you sent us the Holy Spirit. You're guiding us in our life. Thank you for that. You gave us your church, and through your word and the communion, you raise us. Thank you. Satan, the devil, is trying to make us tremble, and he set many traps. But even facing those difficulties, we are thanking you for keeping us and protecting us. And of course, we are weak, but Lord, because you are with us, we are strong and if we have no power the holy spirit um forestalls us in all things so everything is possible we thank you for that and even now we are facing a very complicated era with the coronavirus the coronavirus is spreading everywhere in the world and Because of that, we cannot preach your gospel and the devil is working really hard to block the, block the gospel. But please help us to rely on you only so that in small things, we can have a life going forward and have a very victorious life. Lord, you put in our heart a um, joyful life. Help us to understand this true joy that you put in our heart and that we can only focus on that. Please help us. And in our Christian life, sometimes we are facing difficulties, but despite all of this, we have this joy in our heart Please help us so that through this we can overcome and face all the difficulties in our, in our life. Please guide us and help us. Build up and strengthen your church. There are a lot of brothers and sisters who are weakened. Those who are suffering financially because of the virus. Lord, Please strengthen them so that they can be more courageous and have more strength. Please give them more grace and more mercy. Help them so that no one collapse, no one collapses in those difficult times, so that in this peaceful time we can always have our eyes on you. Please. Give us this grace. And some brothers and sisters are living their Christian life far from church. Please help them to stay healthy and that wherever they are, they can always walk with you. And they can every day walk with you and rejoice with you. And Lord, you grant us a temple in France through Paris Church. help so that we can build up other churches in France so that we can have that chance to spread your gospel to soul, lost souls more and more. God, grant us a temple that is central to the preaching of your gospel and Today, we came before your word, open our heart, and help us to understand it. So that we can behave according to your word and that we can receive your blessings. So that we can all receive your blessings. We entrust everything into the Holy Spirit who guides us. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus who loves us. Amen. 
Psalm 78. Psalm 78, from the verse 70 to the verse 72. This is the main passage for today. Psalm 78, from the verse 70 to the verse 72. We will read it um, often, so please mark this page. Psalm 70, 78, from the verse 70 to the verse 72. If you found it, let's read it together. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the, the use that had um, young brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Until here. Today, the title of the sermon is Victorious Christians. This is the fourth sermon about Victorious Christians. And if I would ask you a more direct question about that sermon, that would be, are you happy? Every Christian wishes to live a victorious life. He wishes to be victorious. And even people in this world, they want to be victorious. They want to succeed in their life. And if we are born again, of course we want to succeed in our Christian life and we want to live a victorious life. Thus, we are living a very zealous life and it's a good thing. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, it's written, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. This is an order from God. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. About serving the Lord, we need to be, we need zeal. And in the first uh, churches, those who preceded us in faith, they were only taking care of the church. And the first thing they were thinking about was to work for God. That was their priority. Their priority was to preach the gospel. So those who received salvation first were very zealed, were very fervent, and that's why we still have church now. We receive salvation and we are living our Christian life, and the reason why it's possible is that those who preceded us in faith sacrificed themselves. And that's why... Nowadays, we also have to be zealed for the works of God. This is a good thing. For us, we have, according to the love of God manifested on the cross, we have to, we have a debt um, to the ancestors of faith who sacrificed themselves for in their Christian life. And if their blood did not um, shed, then I could not receive the um, gospel today. I could not hear the gospel today. And that's why for us as well, it's correct that we, we have to be zealed because the gospel came to us. 
And so we have to pass on to the next generation. This is our mission. And that's why to be sealed, the love we have in the Lord and the love we have for the Lord, we have to be fervent. But sometimes it can happen that the Christian life is a burden and and many Christians are actually living their Christian life um, without being saved. There is those commandments in this law that they cannot um, obey correctly and so this Christian life is just a weight on their shoulders and because they were not saved they think that uh, when we when they are doing good, they can enter the kingdom of heaven. But when they are missing a Sunday at church or when they are missing a fellowship, they think that they are not zealed anymore and so they are afraid to um, die and go to hell. So when they feel that they are not zealed enough, when they are when they feel they are not fervent enough, then they are terrified to go to hell and for us as well Christians we are not under the judge the judgment of of um, hell anymore because we believed in the eternal redemption so now we are not condemned to go to hell anymore and so with a very willing heart we are serving the Lord and when we receive salvation, we are very grateful in our heart. We have that heart loving the Lord. And then we start living the Christian life. And then starts um, this um, walk with uh, God. He listens and answers our pray prayers. And when he is talking i just engrave his word in my heart and i try to live according to his word and when i receive salvation at the beginning this love is our motivation and this is why we are devoted to god and this is why we give body and soul for his work and this is also why we walk with god but after some time Sometimes it can happen that the faith life is unbearable, as if faith life is just a weight and as if it was um, before salvation. We have to walk with God, but it's just getting a habit, as if we were just religious before receiving salvation. And a lot of Christians are losing their um, strength and they are failing in their Christian life. And that's why a lot of saints are leaving the church because they lost their strength. And from the outside, they, the being zealed is a very good thing. Of course, we have to serve the Lord and be fervent in spirit and be to be zealed. You can see it from the outside. But if, it, if this is not with joy and charity and um, happiness and consolation. If those words are not our inner motivation in our uh, Christian life, then it cannot work. If we do not have those motivations, this inner motivation in our Christian life, and if we are just sealed from the outside, then this faith cannot last for a very long time. From the outside, we can think that this Christian is very zealed, but we cannot know if that person is doing it by um, happiness or consolation or joy or love or charity, or if that person is doing uh, is zealed because this is just a habit. So from the outside, we cannot discern we cannot discern this. We cannot make the difference. But there is a diagnostic that we can make, a very simple one, is that we can examine, uh, examine ourselves. And nowadays, um, there are some words that we 
um, according to what we say, according to what we say, if we say me, I, if you think that you speak a lot this way, then you have to know that nine times out of ten, you have to know that your faith life will be unbearable and complicated. It will be out of control. And why? It's because you are at the heart of your faith life. And so you, exclu you excluded, sorry, the Lord. And so you excluded the rewards. You excluded the brothers and sisters. And it's only your zeal and your... Uh, you only use your zeal to... Um, in your Christian life. And so today our main passage is Psalm chapter 78. And so through this, we can see another tool, another useful tool to be victorious in our Christian life. So let's go back to this, verse 17. He also chose David, his servant. Until here. He also chose David, his servant. Here the topic is God. God. God chose. Who did he choose? He chose David. God. He called David. And he, sets, he set his life. He called him in his youth. And he was with him. And... He made sure that David was walking on the path God prepared for him. God sets everyone's life. Please mark this page and open the Psalm 37. Just some Psalms before. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. I will read it to you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When we are born again, then we have to follow the path that God prepared for us. And if it happens sometimes that a person is trying to not walk on the path that God prepared for us, for us, then his life will become very complicated because God set set a life um, a path for us, and this path is to make us know will we obey or disobey, and this is our own choice. This is the choice of man. And the saints of Paris Church, they also have their own path set by God. And I really wish you to be obedient according to this path, because God is preparing a path for every man. And so there is a path that God is taking pleasure in. What did he set? What is that path that... Um, what is the way that God takes pleasure in and how God is guiding me on that path? We have to think about that. What did God set for me? What he set in our life is that actually our life is limited, right? And he set the path of salvation. And in John chapter 6 verse 40, Jesus is saying, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The will of God is to make us live forever, is to give us that everlasting life. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life so that we can enter the kingdom of heaven. And God is ardent concerning his will. And what he wants more than anything is that more souls go to the kingdom of heaven. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it is said, 
who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The true will of God is that we all get saved. This is his heart. This is the heart of God. And the fundamental path that he set for us is that one. And after salvation, the Lord set that path where he is walking with us. And in Exodus chapter 29, verse 46, it is written, Here we can see um, that God brought um, his people out of Egypt. He split the waters of the Red Sea and he allowed them to cross the waters. And so now he's talking to his people saying, Do you know why I brought you out of Egypt? Do you know why I saved you? So in Exodus chapter 29 verse 46 it is written, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God, that I may dwell among them. So here, the purpose of God is to dwell among them. That's why he brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord their God. Thus, God God brought Israel out of Egypt, but why? So that he may dwell among them. That's why he brought them out of Egypt. I am Lord. I am the Lord, their God. So that he can become the God of the people of Israel. He brought them out of Egypt. God saved the people of Israel in Egypt. And for 40 years in the desert, he guided them. With a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, he was walking before them. And during the conquest of the um, Canaan, also um, the Lord was with them. And at that time, at the time of judges and kings, God was also walking with them. And even um, when the people of Israel was rejecting Jesus, even when they were uh, killing him on the cross, crucifying him, God was with, uh, was with them. Even when they were committing this great sin, even when they were scattered all over the world and punished by the nations, even at that moment, God was with the people of Israel. And for us as well now, we are living in an era where the people of Israel um, are restored. And so with our own eyes, we can see that the promises of God are accomplished. And even now, God is with the people of Israel. And this is a fact. We can see it with our own eyes, right? So what God promised when he said... He will never abandon them. This promise, he's keeping it. And he's keeping it even now. And for us as well, we wonder why we are born. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it's written that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven to everything there is a season a time to be born a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted this is what's written in the chapter three our life in our life there is a moment when we get saved and in second corinthians chapter six verse two it is written in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. And you, you have to think when you received salvation. When did you receive salvation? Was it when you were succeeding in your life, when 
um, everything was fine for you. This is the case actually for very few people. It's when we are facing difficulties, when our heart is saddened. This is at the time that the grace of God is shining in my life and so that we were able to grasp the hand that the Lord extended to us. This day was actually a very complicated um, uh, life, but that day was actually the day when I received salvation and so I got saved in my life and my soul is coming from God and on this earth is receiving salvation and then returning to God and this is the biggest purpose set by God and this is why not being saved this this is to abandon the path that is rejoicing God the path that God set for us and to be saved this is walking on the path that God has a set for us. This is walking in the path, rejoicing God. And if we receive salvation uh, from that moment, it is uh, said that we have to have a communion with God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, First Corinthians chapter one verse nine. Let's read it together. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And in this verse, by whom you were called, God called us. And what does it mean, the fact that he called us? He actually called us for salvation. Why did he call us? The purpose is mentioned here. Why did he call us? He called us into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thus, he saved us and then he makes sure that we walk with him, that we are into the fellowship with uh, his son. That's why he called us. Therefore, remaining in the church, which is his body, we are continuously in the communion with the Lord. And this is actually walking in the path set by God, walking in the path that is rejoicing God. And so then after salvation, when we are remaining in the communion, walking with God, to those who are doing like this, there is one order and one um, fervent order, a fervent uh, request. This is the evangelization. In Matthew chapter 28, verse uh, 19 to 20, Jesus is talking to the disciples, talking like this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all. All the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and here there is after there is a promise and lo I am with you always even though to the end of the age amen I am with you always even to the end of the age this is the promise he's giving us and this promise he accomplishes it because God is faithful always he the Lord made that promise and why why is such a promise from God it's because when we are walking with God we can evangelize only when we are walking with God he saved us and when we and we are in fellowship with him he's not um standing aside and he's asking us to preach the gospel we were called to preach the gospel but if the lord is not with us every day until the end of the age then our efforts are just useless without the strength and the power of god we cannot guide 
any soul to um, the salvation. And that's why he promised us to be with us always until the end of the age. And when we are evangelizing, we are facing a lot of difficulties, right? Persecutions, sometimes poverty, extreme poverty. And we are we can face a lot of many different difficulties when we preach the gospel. But my zeal or my passion, that will not allow me to overcome those difficulties. And that's why we need the Lord in us, walking with us. The Lord who resurrected is with me. And he asked Peter, do you love me more than these? He asked him this question three times. And here he is awakening the eternal motivation, this love in the heart of Peter, so that he can give him more power to preach to to preach the gospel. And even now, Christians who are born again, uh, the Lord is with us when I'm living, I triumph over many difficulties. I'm with the church. And for what reason can I still preach the gospel? It's because Jesus re who resurrected is with me. And now I can... Um, overcome, I can go through many trials, but this pain is not in vain. Why? It's because the Lord is in me. And he is with me and every day until the end of times. And the Lord being invisible to the eye, how is he guiding me? I really would like to see the Lord. But how can he guide me? You're curious, right? Let's see in Psalm chapter 147. Psalm chapter 147. Verses nine, uh, 18 and 19. Psalm chapter 147. Verses 18 and 19. I will read it to you. He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgment to Israel. And in the verse uh, 18, it's written, he sends out his word, right? And if we take a look at the verse 15, he sends out his comment to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. God sends out his command to the earth and his word runs very swiftly. His word is uh, moving very efficient. And through his word, in the verse uh, 16, we can see that uh, it's snowing. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. And in the verse seven, um, 18, he sends out his word and melts them, melts the snow. He causes his wind to blow. It's like this uh, warm temperature that we have in spring. This is through his word that he can accomplish it. And in the verse 19, he declares his word to Jacob and to Israel as well. And in his word, we can see how he is guiding our life. This is through his word that he guided Israel. This is through his word, through his word that he allows us to melt our heart that was cold like ice, and this is through his word that he's guiding those who are saved. In Psalm chapter 119, verse 105, 
Psalm 119, verse um, 105. If you found it, let's read it together. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Where to go? Where to set foot? This lamp lets me see where to go. This is a light to my path. And the word of God is this lamp. This is how much God loves man. And this is why he set the path of salvation. And that he set the path of how to walk with God. And he's the one who is setting it. And he's the one who is rejoicing in it. And he's also setting the path of where we are walking with him. And he's not just, he rejoices in this way and he does not stand there with folded arms. He, that's why he gave us his word. And through his word, he is making his creation moves. And this is how he completed the history of mankind. And his word came on this earth. And this word, even now, is efficient and is transforming our hearts and it is guiding us to salvation. His word is guiding my life, me, who received salvation and it is showing me the way to follow. And through his word, I can be well guided in my life. Let's go back to our main passage. You mark the page at Psalm chapter 78, right? Let's go back to it. Verse 17. He also chose David his servant, and two came from the sheepfolds. From following the use that had young he brought him. God chose David, so he called David and he gave him a task. Where did he call David? He took him from the sheepfolds. He called him in the sheepfolds and he was taking care of the ewes, having offspring. He were called at that moment there and those who are saved who are walking with the Lord they are those who are very obedient to the word of God and God is calling them to be his workers and here we can see that he chose David and he took him from the sheepfolds and to accomplish his very precise uh, purpose he is calling to a very suitable person and he was looking for a person like this in on the earth and he calls a suitable person for it for his work and here it's written he took him from the sheepfolds even though he was taking care of the ewes David was actually at the time taking care of the ewes and there is a great teaching we can remember from those verses is that David was not doing anything special when he was called and in the same way God to use us he was not calling us while we were in a school of theology we were not succeeding in our business we were not accumulating accumulating wealth that's what we have to know and where God is calling us is where we are when we are diligent in our work when we are as the use when we are humble this is when he's calling us and we can be very busy at work but someone who is diligent at work will be called and on the contrary someone who is focusing on the study of the bible can have 
a doctorate, for example, if he's not doing what he has to do, then God will not call that person. And when we are faithful in the task God entrusted uh, to us, then this is when God is calling us. And those who are humbling themselves with others are called. And it was the same for David. And when we are humble as the youth, this is when God is calling us. Why? This is to be used for preaching the gospel. And if we are not humble, then we cannot evangelize. But one thing we have to think about is why God called us. If we go back to the main passage, he also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the use that had young he brought him. Two, the purpose is to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So for what purpose God called David? To shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he's calling him to be a shepherd, to shepherd his people. And the reason why David was called is a very important reason. And the first reason is to become a king and to rule the people of Israel. And the second reason is that the king before him, so King Saul, King Saul, when he was humble, when he was humbling himself, God really hold him and used him. But then he was not looking at God anymore and he was focusing on the outer world and he was relying on useless things and so his faith was just a shell and he left that path, the, the path that God set for him. And because of it, because of this um, faith that drifted, then the people of Israel as well, um, their faith just collapsed. And so we can see that distorted faith of the people of Israel because of the king's soul. And so King David was called to correct this. And the reason why, uh, another reason why David was called was to establish him as the ancestor of Jesus. And there is a reason why God also called me. You were called to be a teacher in the church. You were called to be a leader at church. Or you were called to be, um, to do another kind of service. God has a path that he's uh, setting for you and he's calling you to follow it. And the first thing he called us for is salvation. And he's uh, entrusting us a service in his church in order to help other brothers and sisters and to edify um, the faith of other brothers and sisters. And it happens sometimes that the faith of other um, weakened brothers and sisters um, sometimes we are called to strengthen those brothers and sisters in their faith. So we have to think deeply about um, where we were called and why we were called. And David, he knew the reason why he was called. So in the verse 72, in the verse 72, so, so it's written so, right? So. What does it mean, so? In the English translation, it's written so, therefore. So we imply that uh, David understood what was written, what was said before. And so he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands, so. God chose David. He took him from the sheepfolds and he made him shepherd his people. So, 
So David knew he was chosen. He knew he was called to shepherd God's people. And the purpose of God, the purpose God gave him, the path set by God for David, David knew it. And because he knew it well, then he could answer in the verse 72. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So before everything, he knew the will of God. He knew the reason why he was called by God. And so for us as well, we have to know why we were called to, with uh, integrity of heart, and skillful um, hence serve God. David knew the will of God and he had a heart of integrity and skillful hence to answer the call of God. Thus for us as well, we have with a heart of integrity serve the Lord. And the first thing is that we have to know that there is a path that God set for me to know his will. If we know, if we know this, then we can have a heart of integrity. If we know the will of God as David knew it, then we can see with integrity of heart, then we can shepherd God's people. So it depends on the state of our heart. It will really influence us. If our heart is more positive, then it will be easy to follow the path of God. But if we are more negative, then it can happen that we, we may be opposed to the way set by God. That's why we have to have a heart of integrity. And it is said, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. There is a verse like this, right? What this verse means is where does our external strength come from? It comes from our heart. And that's why if we do not gird up the loins of our mind, then we have no strength in our life. That's why the heart is very important. And that's why we have to be, we have to have a heart of integrity. And also, David um, led and guided um, his people with skillful hands. So the heart is very important, but if we are not very well organized, then we cannot accomplish anything. We cannot accomplish what we have to do. So we can have a very passionate and a very ardent um, heart, and we can uh, want to follow God's path, but if we do not have skillful hands, then the degree of achievement will drop sharply. So the first thing we have to know is the will of God. And then we have to have a heart of integrity. And then to apply this, we have to have skillful hands. Let's, let's see in First uh, Chronicles chapter 23. First Chronicles chapter 23. Verse 29. First Chronicles chapter 23. Chapter 23, verse 29. Let's read it together. Both with the showbread and the fine flour for the grain offering, with the unlived cakes and what is baked in the pan, with what is mixed and with all kinds of measures and sizes. Here, if you take a look at this verse, You can see here, David, he is separating the Levites and he's entrusting them some tasks. This is what we see in the chapter 23. Thus David he distributes the service in the temple and he 
reestablish the service of God. And so here it's written, bake in the pan. So in more modern uh, term, we are talking about saucepan or a pan. And it can seem quite, um, quite a small thing. Why do we have to read something like this in the Bible? But even if it's a small thing, if we were called to do something like this, and if we know our um, what we have to do, then there is no way we have to we can reject it. And in the verse twenty eight, because their duty was to help the sons of Aaron in the service of the house of the Lord, in the courts and in the chambers, in the purifying of all holy things and the work of the service of the house of God. So here it's written the service um, in the house of the Lord and in the courts and in the chambers, and so. They are uh, people devoted to um, those who are focused and devoted themselves to the praise. So what are we talking about here? The Christians as well, the first uh, thing they need actually is to know what is the will of God. What is this path set by God for them and the service they have to accomplish. And it's the same for our work. We were called to this or this position and we have to have faith in this and why is the will of God important? We, it is important to know the will of God but why? Sometimes I have a plan, I have a purpose and my head is full of this. Then the will that God has for me, I can reject it. And if this is not the will of God for me, if this is not the will of God for me, then I'm sorry, but we can, of course, be very sealed, but, but provide a necessary effort. We can do our best, but this is similar to, to dig in a land that does not need it. And that's why the first thing is to know the will of God and once we know his will then we have to be honest and sincere in our heart and have a heart of integrity and for example we can see that they bake in a pan the whole day and they are they do that the whole day and it talks about the chambers as well and if we are not honest and if we are not um if we do not have a heart of integrity, then we cannot do that the whole day. If we do not feel and enjoy doing this, then it's very hard to accomplish this work on the long term. And that's why the heart is very important. And that was the second point. And the third point is what we ask. Um, moreover, it is required in stewards that one uh, be found faithful. If the servant is faithful and sincere, of course, his hand will be skillful hence. And we have to think about this. So, to summarize the first thing, the Lord saved me. And in my Christian life, there is a path that he set for me, that he has set for me. And what is certain is that where I am right now, I have to believe that where I am right now and what I have to do right now, I have to be faithful and I have to be sincere in what I'm doing right now. And if we know the will of God, then we have to have a heart of integrity. And those who are faithful, then his hand will be very skillful. So this is in the right order. Therefore, us, Christians, those are things we have to know. So we have to be zealed and not be lazy. So we have to be zealed and not be lazy. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. This is necessary. But I talked about that at the beginning of the sermon. 
we know Christians, saved Christians, you born again Christians know that we have to love God, we have to follow the will of God and that we have to be very zeal in our Christian life. We all know this. But what I talked about until now, those are facts that each one of us know because this is a heart that uh, all saved Christian has. But if we go back to the main passage, Let's go back to the Psalm chapter 78. There is something we have to think about. Psalm chapter 70, 78 verses 72. 72, I will read it again. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So... He shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. But the main point of those verses, where do you think it is? To the integrity of his heart, by the skillfulness of his hands, have integrity of heart, to be clever, those things are very essential. We know it because we heard it many times. But when we hear this kind of things, we can misunderstand as well. The world we are living in is actually, you need tenacity, you need to be zealed to survive. This is a fact because on the contrary, in this competitiveness living in this world then we can let ourselves be left behind and so we can collapse and so we bite our lips and we just take all the pain and we will ring out until the last drop of zeal to live in this world and it can happen that we we'll live sometimes uh, live like this sometimes but isn't it too hard for work and for our life in this world, there is no joy and there is no happiness living this way. Why? It's because it is set here to the integrity of his heart by the skillfulness of his hands. But what men see are, are things from the outside. So, to the integrity of his heart, by the skillfulness of his hands. But if we focus on those outer things, then it can only be difficult in our life. Integrity, cleverness. I see this and then I'm thinking, oh, me too, I have to have uh, integrity in my heart. So, you can be looking for your own zeal and you can think ah oh, i have to get in um, skillful uh, hands so i i have to be competent in this area and i have to be more clever in this but if you're listening to the word of god with this kind of heart then in your heart you will this is actually something that has to come from your heart and be manifested from the outside but if you're just sealed and fervent from the outside but there is nothing in your heart and if you're looking for um, um, achieving your own purpose sometimes it can happen that we react this way but if we are not careful then faith can be unbearable and can be a burden and of course in front of the Lord we have to have a integrity of heart and we have to make effort to have skillful hands but what I'm talking about here this is not about what we show to others this is not about the outer things I'm talking here about what comes from deep inside of your heart that you can see it from the outside 
And in the verse 70, it is written, and took him from the sheep folds, from following the ewes that had young he brought him. That's what written here, right? And when I'm saying this verse, actually, most of people will just uh, remember integrity of heart, skillful uh, hands, and they will just stop here. And so... They will be zealed, but their Christian life will be very heavy and they will collapse. And what is the difference between David and me? And I was thinking about this very seriously and actually those verses came to me. And took him from the sheepfolds, from following the use that Hai Young he brought him. That's where, that's where he took David. And I was meditating uh, those, uh, this part, this chapter, and I realized here that David was chosen. Why God took him? Why did God take him from the sheepfolds, from following the use? Did you already think about that? David accomplished something very important for God. But before he accomplished it, he was always with the use. You noticed this, right? David was... When he was chosen by God to be king, he was with the use. Let's open the Bible at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So in the verse 11, we can see Samuel, the prophet, um, coming to uh, Jesse. And so he's looking for the next king to establish for the people of Israel among uh, the family of Jesse. And the seven brothers, um, and the first, um, the seven brothers of David said, um, he said no to them. And so we have to take a look at the end of the first um, seven. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but look, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the appearance can seem very nice and pleasant, but the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He does not look at his appearance. God, he's calling, he's establishing, and he's entrusting his task, task to um, people he tested. So the seven brothers of uh, David were not received, actually, by God. They were not chosen. But but God is called, and at that moment, Jesse is saying, I have even younger but he's just taking care of the, of the use and he's a shepherd and what is he talking about here he's talking about the appearance here right uh, he's weak and this is a vile task him the youngest how can he receive the anointing to be a king god said for the lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the lord looks at the heart so God so um, David with the use and he tested his heart and David himself after being anointed was with the use. First Samuel chapter 17 verse 20. First Samuel chapter 17 verse 20. We can see here the battle between David and uh, Goliath and we can see so first, 
1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as just he had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. So here, David received the anointing to be king. To be king. This is the, the meaning here. But this is in the time God has set. But at that moment, his purpose was to keep the sheep. And um, his father told him. But when he's arriving at the camp, Desi asked him, his father asked him to do something, but then he left the sheep with a keeper and he comes to the battlefield. And so he arrives to the camp, he came to the camp, and before fighting Goliath, we can see that David was just keeping the sheep. So to summarize, when he received the anointing to be king, he was with the sheep and even before this battle against uh, Goliath, he was still taking care of the sheep. And what are you thinking of uh, here? To David, to uh, keep, to take care of the ewes, um, to, to him it was the most uh, precious thing. Why? Actually, he was very humble, taking care of the use, and he knew that was his task. And it is very important to accomplish the will of God. But in his heart, deep in his heart, uh, he really, truly loved to take care of the sheep. So when he's doing it, he's actually very joyful. And David, before uh, becoming a king, from the beginning, he was really rejoicing, taking care of the sheep, they, um, according to the task that God entrusted him. He was really rejoicing. And when we think about that, we can see it very easily, actually. For example, um, you can take care of the sheep and you can shepherd uh, you can shepherd the ewes and you can shepherd the people what what is the difference here this is just a question of um of a scope but um to david this is actually the same task david he um, is uh, fighting against a wild beast and uh, sometimes when we take care of the sheep, we have to fight against the cold uh, temperature or the very, we have to fight, the, um, we have to endure the fiery rays of the sun and we have to take care of, of the flocks. And um, he needs all his attention to take care of the use. But um, David, he was doing it with joy and if he had not that joy how do you think he could have endured this uh, job for so long this is an example that I would like to take and to explain you because this is something that really happened um, in Korea in Seoul uh, some land are more expensive than others and there is uh, Gangnam and in that area if you if you open a hospital or a clinic we can actually um, earn a lot of money and there was that dentist he opened his clinic in Gangnam and not a long time after, he got uh, bankrupt and lost everything, but he has no money and so he's leaving uh, Seoul, he's leaving the city center and he goes 
to another places and there he opens um, a smaller a smaller clinic and people um, are really a lot of people went there actually and he had the the opportunity to open his business in a very expensive area but he got bankrupt but then he decided to open his business in a far area and we can see that his business is going actually really well and so we understand and we can see that for example when the dentist the dentist actually was explaining that at first it was going well a lot of uh, people were coming he had a lot of patients he had a lot of benefits and he even changed his car uh, into a mercedes but after some time he got less and less patients and so he got really worried wondering uh, i'm really depressed i'm really sad and i'm about to get um bankrupt i'm about to go bankrupt and a friend asked him you're earning a lot of money aren't you happy you're happy right and the dentist answered not at all do you think i'm happy like this not at all why you're earning a lot of money and you do what you want you even changed your car aren't you happy and he answered something very surpri surprising how do you think i can be happy every day i have to remove dirtiness from the mouth of patients who come to my office this is what he answered and his friend was really uh, surprised. Then how could you do this job for so long? And the dentist answered, actually, actually, when you see a patient, you can see a number. Uh, for this patient, uh, I will have to do this 100 euros. Or for that one, I will have to do this, ah, 1,000 1, euros. Oh, I will have to do this to this patient, ah, 5,000 euros. And so he is, he is healing actually his uh, patient. But the only thing he is thinking about is the money he gets from them. And so after he earned that much money, he can see, he can change his uh, car, his house. But don't you think that people uh, know it? Actually, they know it. They, they feel how they are received. They feel how they are treated. So that dentist, he had no joy in his heart. And that's why he's working but he's only taking care of money. So can you imagine how hard that is? But when he had nothing and when he went, um, when he left the city center and when he built a smaller business, then it was different. Patients were entering the room and they were saying, ah, oh, it hurts here and there. And and they can see the dentist saying like, oh, you must have been um, suffering so much. I will try my best. And so the dentist um, is talking to his assistant saying, can't you see this patient is suffering so much? So much? Why didn't you tell me? And so after he's just thinking, how can I treat that patient and cure him? And so the patients can feel it. And so the rumor is spreading and people came more and more to find that dentist. So of course he was succeeding, succeeding in his business. So what is the difference between them, between these two cases? 
cannot stop at, uh, oh, I have to be nice. That's not it. Truly, in the heart of that person, to have the willing to treat the patient and to cure him so that he can be in peace, so that the patient can be in peace, isn't it the joy, isn't it rejoicing the dentist? Yes or no. And in this world as well, if we have no joy in our heart, even if we earn a lot of money, we cannot continue uh, to uh, keep that the job we have. And David, deep inside his heart, it was a joy to take care of the folks, uh, of the flocks, and that um, he felt actually really happy to take care of the ewes and he was, that was a um, task that uh, God entrusted him and God was, and David was rejoicing in, him, in it. And in the Psalm, Psalm um, chapter 16, Psalm chapter 16 verse, verse 3, as for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Take a look at this verse. As for the saints who are on the earth, so the pious men, the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And so David took care, was taking care of the, the youth and he shepherded the people of God. But he had the same pleasure doing it. And the task was as important as the other. And he was rejoicing in it. And after, he had to take care of the people of Israel. But this is a task that God entrusted, it, entrusted him. And after the use, he had to take care of the people of Israel. And the saints, the pious men, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And David... David, he had affection for the youth and he had affection for the people of Israel. And of course, he was taking care of them. And of course, he was rejoicing, taking care of the youth and he was rejoicing in it. That's why whatever the wild, uh, whatever um, the situation was, or, um, he was just taking care of the flocks. And to him, it was very important and he was rejoicing that this is what makes him happy deep inside. And here it is written, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And David, he was... He was rejoicing about the excellent ones, same as the youth was, were rejoicing him. Because the people of Israel were rejoicing him as well, deep inside. And that's why he could have a heart of integrity and skillful hands so that he could take care of the people of Israel. So to win over uh, somebody is a habit, but same as losing it can be a habit as well so a person who is continuously triumphing in small uh, things and a, a person who is const continuously losing is losing also in small things so triumphing can be a habit and persons who feel happiness triumphed one time and so they had that joy in their heart and so they are uh, pursuing that path remembering the joy they they experienced when they triumphed and so they will look forward um, triumphing always every time and we say that actually geniuses cannot surprise those who make an effort but those who make efforts cannot surpass those who take pleasure into doing something so geniuses cannot surpass those who make an effort. It's because those who make efforts cannot surpass those who take pleasure in it. It's because when someone takes 
pleasure into doing something, then no one can reach to that person. A person who is rejoicing uh, about what he's doing will triumph over everything, everyone. That's why if we take pleasure uh, doing God's work, then the best way is to triumph over small things. So if we try to uh, think about David, what do you think about? He is actually a very remarkable king. He is actually, he actually overcame very huge trials and difficulties. This is what we see from the outside and around us. There are those who are doing very great things. And when we take a look at them, what do you think? We think, oh, this is a huge company. And we only see the outer part. What we, um, we only see what they do great for the Lord. But we have to ask David, um, what did he consider? Uh, what was the most valuable? And this is a very simple question. David, at what moment were you the happiest? When you were doing, when you were actually taking care of the flocks, when he was shepherded the ewes, he loved it. He was rejoicing in it and it was the task that God entrusted to him and he knew that this was the path that God prepared for him and to him to shepherd the ewes, he was actually very joyful inside of his heart and you know that joy I'm not talking about um, I'm not talking about this joy when you do something and you think oh that's interesting I like it no I'm not talking I'm not talking about this kind of joy that joy uh, that kind of joy who, which disappears but I'm talking about the joy who crosses the brain and the marrow did you already experience this kind of joy and I really would like to ask you when are you the happiest? Without think thinking about the appearance, you have to think about this deep inside of you, very deeply, you have to think about that. And some of you are coming to me and asking me, oh, what kind of service should I do? Others are asking me, oh, what kind of, which major should I choose at the uni at university? Or, or where should I open my business in what kind of area, business area? And I'm asking them, when are you the happiest? When you're doing what kind of uh, things? When do you, when are you the happiest? And you have to think about that and then just do it. Just do it as your job. And you can think that I'm answering off topic, but I'm not. Talk, talking about the position or I'm not talking about um, the products you will sell or I'm not talking about the service that the person will do at church but I'm talking about what is actually rejoicing that person I'm not talking about um, rejoicing in sin of course I'm not talking about that but I'm if if there is joy committing sin or if there is joy committing iniquities, this is just committing a sin. So I'm not talking about that. I'm excluding this, okay? But there is a gift, there is a talent that God gave to each one of us. And it's not um, linked to our uh, position and it's not linked to uh, the service thinking ah oh, she can play piano very well or so she could be in the choir it's not like this your job or or the ministry at church is not linked to our talent but there is a joy that god is giving us when we are doing something and he's putting that joy in our heart and this joy, we have to follow it. This is what um, is making us uh, actually um, doing the service, giving me the energy, the motivation to do what I'm doing. Because each one of us 
um, working or doing the service can be very exhausted and tired. But when we are doing something with joy, even if we are exhausted, we will never collapse. Or we can collapse, but um, we can think, oh, I'm exhausted, but I feel very grateful and I'm rejoicing. And we can be in that, in that state and I really wish that to you. And when are you the happiest? So, uh, for example, some of you are cooking cookies and they are just having pleasure cooking for others. And they're saying, oh, this is when I'm doing this, that I'm the happiest. I really like to do that. But this is not a service in the church and this is not linked to my job. So some of you are telling me this. But this is not the case. For example, let's imagine you are a teacher at church and but you like you like to cook and if this is where you rejoice when if if you are rejoicing doing doing it and if you uh, share it with the children then you will always renew your energy and so this is through this kind of joy that we can do the service that we can accomplish the service and there are others who like to talk to um, others and especially when I arrived to France I was really surprised about something it's that French people they like to talk they like to have a debate but those who are uh, saved and who like to talk in that case uh, don't you think that during the evangelization this kind of people can rejoice and uh, talking when we are a teacher when we are teaching the Bible to the children it is a service but it's actually rejoicing us because we are talking so for example in the fellowship helping brothers and sisters so this communion edifying brothers and sisters if this is our joy if this is what makes us happy then it's um, good for others so the ministry and the task that are entrusted to us then we can rejoice in it so Christian life is not simple, but it's not because it's not simple, simple that um, we have to collapse. So there is that happiness, that joy that we feel. The question is, when I'm doing the service, do I feel that joy? Am I happy? So I also thought about that, actually. So I'm a preacher, but I also thought about when am I the happiest? At what moment in my life am I the happiest? So I really thought about that very deeply and before before being a preacher I was actually teaching English to um, children and I was also air traffic controller um, an air traffic controller at the airport and it's a very classic job you have some glasses everything and after that, I also had to interpret um, for some meetings at a nuclear plant when there were conference between Koreans and foreigners. I had to interpret the conference. And so the common point was to all those um, jobs was English and it's true that I like to study English actually and I thought ah isn't my joy coming from English that's what I thought but it was not really linked to my joy it's true that as an air traffic controller I had to use um, English uh, daily and uh, many people said, wow, this is a very uh, good job. This is for the elite. And everyone was saying this, but this is the job I hated the most. I really hated that job. And so English was not, English was not the joy. So if English was not my joy, then what was it? And I thought about that and I thought, ah, oh, yes. This is when I rejoice to see change. 
change in other terms. It's to see something uh, being renewed and taking life. So this is a long meditation. After a long meditation, did you already feel that joy in your brain coming from your brain? that is transmitted throughout the body, from the vertebrae to my spinal cord. This is, this kind of joy exists and it's coming throughout the, the body. And so when you see a soul changing and receiving salvation, then in my heart I have a very great joy. And this is why during the summer retreat we can have counseling until uh, 2 or 3 a.m. And the uh, next morning you have to wake up very early and you have to... Um, have other counselings and so um, we are very exhausted and after we enter the dormitory we just collapse but we still we are still very happy and this joy is just um, is just guiding us because we can see brothers and sisters um, being okay and souls being um, saved so when we see a problem finding a solution, I'm really rejoicing in this and I'm feeling great. So when I see it from my own eyes, myself, I'm changing. I'm changing myself and I'm living again and it's making me rejoice. So living Seeing that change, it's like coming back to life. And so it's linked to... Coming back to life is linked to, to, to changing. And when I preach the gospel, when I'm preaching the gospel during the Bible seminar, you can see the sinners changing and becoming righteous. And when you have counselings, you can see a Christian who had a lot of problems becoming a very precious worker for God. And you can see that change. And this is when I'm the most um, happy. And this is why I want to see some change every time. And it's true that in our, in this era, it is very complicated. And it's because if we do not have any joy inside of us, it is very hard to survive. It's when we just charge the battery of our uh, phone. We also have to charge the battery of our joy. And we have to be uh, plugged the whole time to recharge our battery of joy. And this is why I always, constantly, I have to see this change. And so I'm preaching, there is the sermons, and that's why when I prepare the sermon, I sometimes do not even sleep. And evangelizing, counseling, it's bringing some change. And when I experience this change, this is when I rejoice. This is my strength. And so to conclude, the path that God has set for me is not a path that I can change. There is a mission that I have to accomplish. And this is not something that I can do with my own strength and my zeal. This is not what will allow me to uh, finish it. This is something I cannot achieve by myself. That's why. That's why I'm also relying. Uh, I still stick to small changes. Why? So that in my heart, deep inside, I can feel that joy. And saints, brothers and sisters, when do you feel this great joy that comes from the Lord? You have to do what is rejoicing you in the Lord. And then you are victorious in small things. This is a habit. To triumph is actually a habit. Let's pray. God, thank you. You saved us. You guided us into your church. Thank you. 
you set our path and you entrusted us a mission and to accomplish this mission you put that strength of rejoicing and this joy in my heart and help us so that I can only look at um, you and questioning my heart to know where I am rejoicing the most. Help us to be to have this motivation to accomplish your work so that we can only focusing on we can we would be only focusing on this and that we can have we can find the motivation to do it inside of us. So this mission you entrusted us is a burden and it's huge but we know that this is very important and that's why we wish to triumph over everything and thus you gave us this joy which is allowing us to triumph help us to find that joy so that we can triumph over small things help us to be this kind of brothers and sisters guide us thus May that the Christian life not a burden, that we not collapse, but please help us so that we can continue to be filled with joy. And until your second coming, help us so that none of us leave the ranks of the faith. Help us. We thank you for everything and we pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.